Hey, what's up everyone? Eric Say here. Ah, oh, it's good to be here. Feels feels good to be back. How's everyone been? Um, well, yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm Eric Say. I'm the uh, owner and uh, creative director over here at Game Day Creative. We are a broadcast uh, motion graphics agency. We specialize in uh, television uh, graphics with an emphasis on sports. But we do a little bit of everything, uh, and we're definitely big C4D users. And you know what? I'm going to show the demo reel. I think you'll get a pretty good idea of who we are and what we do. Cool. So that's uh, that's some of the stuff we've been up to in the last uh, the last year or so. And actually, that demo reel is already a little bit out of date. The new stuff that's coming is fire. So keep an eye out for that. Um, well, anyway, uh, I have a little bit of a, a little bit of a confession to make. So when Matthias approached me, I was like, "Hey, do you want to speak at this, uh, this upcoming Max on event?" I was like, "Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. I love love talking talking shop about C forty. Could talk about it all day." And I, I thought about it a little bit. I kind of started to panic. I was like, oh no, I haven't actually been using C40 in the last few months. I've been I've been art directing and like running the company. And, was, and people keep telling me that's a good thing. I'm not sure I'm convinced. But either way, I've been I've been off the box for a bit. I, I haven't I haven't been working it. I was like, well, crap. What what projects am I going to talk about? And, and the more I thought about it, I was like, oh, you know, sure. Maybe I'm not in C40 every day like I used to be, but I'm still around C40 all day, every day. And I talk to C4D artists all day, every day. And I definitely keep an eye on what's happening with, you know, the industry. Uh, I keep an eye on the horizon. I keep an eye on C4D uh, and what's happening. And I thought there might be some really cool things that are C4D adjacent that I could talk about. Um, so that's some of the information I wanted to share with you guys today. And a lot of this comes from speaking with artists, people who work in C4D, all day, every day, and what their concerns are, what their favorite tools are, what their features are, what they love about C40, what they use, what they don't use, uh, things like that. And there's a few things that keep, a, there's a few very common reoccurring themes uh, with C40 artists today. And a big one is efficiency. So a lot of what I wanna touch on today is gonna be some efficiency tricks uh, for C4D. But actually, I have a little title slide. Let me pull this up real quick. Maybe I can share uh, some of the other things I'm gonna talk about. So some of the stuff we're gonna go through today. I wanna to touch on the state of affairs. I think the industry is changing. I wanna sort of set the stage for what I know and think about uh, what's real in the C4D uh, universe. Uh, I wanna talk about some efficiency stuff. In particular, I wanna talk about the take system, uh, crypto mats. We're gonna talk a little bit about uh, VR and AR, and then we're also going to talk about a little bit about uh, where the industry is headed, the uh, the future. Um, so, with that said, let's start with a little bit of the state of affairs. Um, one, it is a very good time to be a C4D artist or a 3D artist in general. Uh, there's a lot of work out there. Uh, the demand for video is through the roof. It turns out that the world shifting to vid digital video is good for digital video artists. Um, yeah, C4D artists, I feel like have never been in higher demand. And actually on that note, after this call, if, if you're looking for work, you can send me your resume, that'd be, um, always looking for artists. It's a good time to be a C4D artist. And I think it's gonna stay a good time. I think the future is very bright for 3D artists and uh, those of us in the video 
video production world. Um, but another big thing about the state of affairs is as I was talking to artists and, you know, a big <laughs> conversations that always comes up over and over again is not like, oh man, did you see that really co cool new feature? Although that conversation does still happen, but there's a lot of conversations around like, hey, do you use Zoom or Google Meets? Or do you use Google Drive or Dropbox? Um, the world's changed a little, you know, global pandemic, uh, work from home is coming up and it's shifted the way people work. And that's the sort of stuff that orbits in and around C4D and matters. Um, and I think it's still worth talking about. So we're gonna cover some of that as well um, with some of the efficiency things and, and some tricks. So uh, yeah, we're gonna, so let's, let's dive into it. So I wanna talk about efficiency. Uh, and I, I promise at some point I'm gonna open C4D in this presentation, but you're gonna have to put up with me a little bit longer. All right, so efficiency. Everyone knows efficiency is king, but let's just, let's just do a quick review on why. The faster you can iterate ideas, the better your end product's going to be. The more things you can try, solve, explore, the better your final product would be, is going to be. So efficiency isn't just about <laughs> getting something done quickly and out the door as fast as possible. It's about the ability to iterate. And it's pretty, uh, I feel like it's pretty time tested and, and proven. The more iterations, the better your final product uh, will turn out. So efficiency, is good for creativity, it's good for your final product, it's good for workflow, and it's also good for when you do just have to meet a deadline. Um, so there's some efficiency tricks I wanna talk about, and I wanna talk about them through the lens of a project. So let me go ahead and pull up uh, the final render, or one of the final renders, of the project I'm gonna be talking about. And this project in particular required not only a lot of iterations to get to its final form, but its final form requires a lot of updating and changing. And that'll make a little more sense when I show it. Uh, the project is a map, a map that we made for Twitch Rivals. Uh, Twitch Rivals is a show that appears on uh, twitch.tv, which is this online streaming service, uh, typically related around uh, video games or content creators, you know, live stream, whatever it is that they're up to. Um, and Twitch Rivals in particular is a show produced by Twitch on that platform where they bring content creators together to you know, play games against each other, talk with each other, uh, do some in real life events with one another. Um, and with this, this show, this property, they, these are always big events. So they get these content creators together on a specific date and time. And they were looking for a way of showcasing these dates and times. They were looking to make a calendar, but they didn't want it to just be a, uh, a text calendar. Actually, ah, look at that. It's, I can still be in the corner. Um, they didn't want it to just be a, a simple basic text calendar, which is like October 4th is the Minecraft event and October 2nd is the Power Meet. They wanted something that was a dynamic, interesting visual, a graphic. You know, they're a, vi they're a video company. They still broadcast. They want this stuff to look cool. So we started coming up with ideas of how to display a calendar, upcoming events, uh, as a graphic. And we landed on this map. And there's a few reasons we selected the map as the route to go for this. Um, one is it relies on a lot of front-loaded knowledge, knowledge that uh, video game players already have. And a huge portion of Twitch's audience are video games players. There's map logic that they know and understand. And actually, this is a good segue for this, as we were researching what this map was gonna be and what the schedule was gonna be, some of our inspiration were video game maps. So here's a, a Mario map, you know, Mario has really mastered the art of making maps. They understand like how to separate binomes. They're unique. They understand like the right level of decoration versus, you know, practical map objects. Uh, they understand how to hide secrets. So there's a sense of exploration. It's colorful, it's engaging. You want to look at it more. Uh, and people know how to read this. They, gamers know how to move through these maps and advance through the levels and that, you know, each castle represents a different event, if you will. So there's a lot of front and loaded knowledge and a lot of visual inspiration in uh, video games maps. We also actually looked at like the Disney Magic Kingdom map. Uh, something I liked about this one is like the exaggeration of scale. Um, you know, they were very, very loose with their scale, but you know where the main events are or the main attractions are in, in Disneyland and, uh, and how to navigate it. So we landed on this idea for this map to display, um, to display the upcoming schedule, but now we had to build it. Now there's a couple things with building a map and a schedule is it gets updated, it changes. Um, as events are announced, we have to populate these islands. So you'll see like there's this uh, little ghosted Minecraft island here. We're teasing that there's a Minecraft event coming up or a Warzone event and we're gonna wait for those to get announced to light them up. Um, 
But anyway, this map will need to be updated pretty much weekly as events unfold. And in addition to that, we want the, the map to sort of be this living graphic where not only do we announce new events on it, but we immortalize uh, accomplishments that happened in past events. So an example of that is we have this Power Meet Island. This is a weightlifting competition. Um, and during that competition, 20 personal records were set. So we wanted to add these little artifacts that immortalize the happenings, the actual outcomes of these events. And the idea being that at the end of the year, once this whole universe has played out, you can look at this complete graphic and get one, a huge sense of scale and two, uh, sort of like a, a list of the memories and the uh, celebration of what happened during this year. Uh, so what all this boiled down to is this map needed a ton of iterations to find what it was going to visually look like and behave, but also needs to be able to be updated quickly, um, which led us to having to do a lot of a, a lot of efficiency things. There was just a ton of uh, a ton of uh, ingrained efficiencies that had to happen. So. I would like to talk about some of those efficiency things inside of C4D. I'm gonna do it guys, 11 minutes in and we're just opening the program. All right, so here's the C4D file for the map. Um, there's a couple things that uh, I wanna touch on just, just right away that are some of my favorite efficiency, uh, efficiency tricks and then there's a couple that are unique to just this map. So uh, right off the gate, uh, right out the gate, uh, R25 has an interface overhaul. And I think it's a home run. I think there are some really cool things in the R25 interface. Uh, it might be a little intimidating to learn it again, but it's worth it. So the number one thing I like is that my different scenes are now on tabs up top because I use the internet like everyone else and this is what I'm accustomed to. Um, so I really love that. You know, previously, I feel like the most efficient way of switching between scenes, it might still be the most efficient, but it's not the most intuitive for me, is to press V and then go down to the projects and hop here. But of course, alternately, you can come up to window and select them from here. But I just love that they're up there as tabs. That, that really means the world to me. Um, another kind of global efficiency trick that uh, I'm sure everyone knows uh, is if you press S, it, it selects an object and it like isolates that object. It zooms in on whatever you have selected in your viewport so you, you can look at it. But something that uh, I really love about uh, R25 is if you select an object, and you come over here uh, to the object tab and press S, it will automatically expand in the entire hierarchy to whatever you have selected. So you don't have to scroll through and try and find it. It will just uh, uncollapse everything uh, and, and go right to whatever you have selected, uh, which I think is just a huge efficiency boon. So anyway, those are just uh, two like quick, um, quick fast tips, but some of the stuff I wanted to get into that it is, some of it's a little basic, but I still think it's incredibly powerful, was the take system. And actually the artist who put together this uh, this map file, huge shout out to Nathan, uh, was the one who was like, no, no, you, you have to talk about the take system because it's powerful and it's really good for something like uh, this map. So hopefully all of you are familiar with the take system, but I'll give you a little bit of review for those who are not. Um, so the take system in C4D allows within a single uh, project file for you to have different toggles of objects turned on and off, different animations, different textures, different materials, and you can different cameras, and you can switch through those very quickly to output different renders where everything is still in the same project file. And you can hook it up so that some objects are global. So for example, if I wanted to move this big center Twitch cube and I was on the main, it's gonna, it's a heavy project, it's gonna take it a bit, but, uh, and I was on this main take, I could select this, move it, and it would update it on all these child takes. Uh, in addition, I can modify these child takes independently of one another. So for example, on some of these, we wanted to do um, close-ups of certain islands, like I showed before the close-up of the power meet. We can have that all in the same C4D file with a new camera, any different texture changes or material changes that update to this. So I'll show you real quick how to set this up. Um, this particular take system is much more complicated than uh, the one I'm going to show, but I think the important thing to know is like the information that you can store in the take system is pretty robust. Everything from what materials are applied to an object, uh, what camera is being used, um, what objects exist, the stoplight on objects, so you can turn off stuff on and off in different takes. So let's just do a quick, uh, a quick little overview of how the uh, the take system. So right off the off the bat, uh, the first thing I want to do is turn on this auto take. 
And this is uh, like the same equivalent of auto keyframe, so that anything I do inside the takes will automatically be recorded uh, to that take. Any modifications I make to an object or something within a take gets logged away as a part of that take. So let's make some takes. Uh, create a new child, create another new child. So I'm gonna name this first one cube, and the second one sphere, uh, and then I'm gonna come back up here to the main take. And in this main take, I'm gonna make a cube. Uh, and since I did that on the main take, all the takes below it that are children will have a cube in it. But if I come to just the sphere take, select him, and then add a sphere, drag this out where you can see it, you'll see that that sphere doesn't show up in the cube take because I just added it to the sphere take. And this is really where the take system starts to get powerful. You can have like a logo and let's say the sphere is the sponsor logo. Sometimes you don't want the sponsor logo, but it's all still recorded. And then if I come back to the main take and I start like, modifying the sponsor logo and or the, the hero logo and making updates and stuff this will be passed on through all of them but my sponsor logo is still hanging out over here this of course works with more than just objects it works with animations and cameras and materials let's, let's show some of that so i'm gonna come into the uh the materials make a new material let's get it uh, something red something we see really easy uh i'm gonna come to the cube take and i'm gonna oh <laughs> It records too much. Uh, this is actually a really good point though. I changed the color of that material inside the sphere take. So in the cube uh, in the cube take, and actually I'm just gonna roll with this because this, this is a really good example. It was stored as a different color. And you can see everything here that has this uh, bluish tint, that's all being recorded by the auto take. So anytime I update any of these values, that update is stored to just that take. So if I take this blue material and I put it on the face in this take and then I come here and it's a red material in this take, which is so cool. Sometimes you might want the exact same geometry to have two different material layouts. Like let's say there's a light and dark version of it. You can set this up in takes. You don't need different scene files. It's all just stored. I get that this stuff's pretty basic, but these are really the kind of efficiency king stuff that, that really rules it really rules cinema. Um, so I just wanted to touch on that. Um, but there's something else with efficiency that I'm even way more excited to talk about. So let's get over there. So I'm gonna hop back to the main product using the useful tabs. Um, all right, so crypto mats. And these are so cool. When I found out about them, they blew my mind. Feature of Redshift. Um, so before I get into how to make a crypto mat, let's just talk about Redshift uh, real fast. So uh, GPU renders are huge, they're powerful. Uh, they're definitely the future, you know, real-time rendering, all that. Uh, and there's quite a few on the market, right? There's Octane, V-Ray, Redshift. Uh, as a studio, we selected to go with Redshift. And the reason we picked Redshift is because Cinema, Maxon, selected uh, Redshift. And we have faith that they're gonna bring the same like efficiencies, uh, ease of use, and uh, quality uh, to Redshift that they did uh, their other products. Um, and in addition, I personally love that Redshift is a biased render. I don't need a perfect simulation. I just need something that looks really good, that happens quickly, and that I don't have the right code to know how to use. So those are sort of what led us to Redshift, and I've been incredibly happy. It's absolutely worth it. Highly recommend it. Um, so that being said, um, there's a couple uh, just really fast uh, tricks to getting uh, quick previous things out of Redshift that I want to show, and then we can hop over to, a, or I can show you the crypto mats, which are just so cool. Not, I'm not overhyping these at all either. They're actually that cool. Uh, all right, so let's open up our render settings. So one thing I find with Redshift, uh, well, inside the render settings, there's this basic tab and there's the advanced tab. I personally like the advanced tab. It gives me a little more control over what I'm doing. Um, there's some things that I really like to change in here. So. One is your interactive render. This is what commands your, you know, Redshift render preview. Uh, turn this on, get it running. Um, is driven by the samples in this progressive passes. I like to turn this way down to 16. It's gonna give you really grainy renders, but really quickly. Uh, and I find for look dev that they're, they're not even that grainy actually. They're kind of grainy, um, but it's enough I can see through that, but I can just like my color, my lighting, my composition, and it updates quickly. Um, now for the final output, final rendering, of course, bucket rendering gives you access to multi-pass. So you pretty much have to use that. It's not as fast as progressive. Um, but I find, uh, that the samples need to be of, of course higher than 16. So that's all controlled down here by the unified sampler. Um, 
one thing I like to do is I like to turn, well, you can use automatic sampling, which will kind of solve a lot of this for you. Um, but I like to, again, dial this in. So something I really like is um, to take my minimum samples down to two, because there's some areas of my scene that are very uh, simple and don't need a lot of sampling. So maybe like the pure black of these screens, for example, you still need that many samples to kick out black. Um, but the maximum samples, uh, there's quite a bit of range here. And this varies per project. But what I find is like, the lowest you can go for like final quality um, is 512. And even then that's like flirting with it still being kind of grainy. I usually do like 1024 for my final renders, but Redshift handles a lot of samples really well. You can take this up to 2048 or even higher and it's not gonna break it. I mean, it's gonna take longer to render, but you can do some really high quality stuff with that. Um, so don't be afraid to turn up these samples. Um, and then one other thing uh, that I usually like to mess with is the uh, global illumination settings. Uh, of course, brute force is a more accurate a global illumination uh, simulation. Uh, however, I find that for most of the stuff I do, it's overkill. Um, I find that a double irradiance point cache uh, or cache in cloud um, gives me a really good GI simulation without the uh, render times of the brute force. Um, I also find that by default, Cinema or Redshift bounces some light um, inside of its scene, sort of like it has GI without this even being in it enabled. Um, so the only time I find I really have to get GI enabled is if I'm going, if I'm doing um, emissive materials or have something that's really lighting delicate, like an architectural rendering scene where you know there's sunlight coming in and there's lamps and stuff, and I really want this high. Uh, this high-end photo real look but for like motion graphics and stuff i find uh, you can get away without global illumination and redshift sometimes um and it certainly does save on render times uh one last thing i want to touch on in this redshift uh, render view is the ipr uh, undersampling uh, if you turn this on just over here in the the render view it reduces the number of samples as if you adjusted it here but it only does it over here in the previewer which is just a nice way to get even faster results. So I usually work with the IPR undersampling turned all the way up to five, um, just to get the fastest result out uh, possible. Anyway, those are some quick, quick red chipped render settings that I use, um, but let's get into crypto mats because they're awesome. So to generate a crypto mat, uh, I'll show you how to generate them first and then I'll show you what they do. So to create a crypto mat, uh, you go up here to the Redshift AOV manager and you add, well, they're already in here, but I'll do it again so you can see how it works. Um, you add crypto mat. So they're over here on the side, it's a little bigger. Uh, grab a crypto mat and drag it in. And by default, the crypto mat is gonna be set up to spit out, uh, the ID type is gonna be set to object name. And what this does and what crypto mats do in general is they make object buffers for everything all at once without applying any tags. And it's, oh, it gets so good. So by object ID, this is going to create a quote unquote object buffer for everything in the scene, every single object. But I'm gonna add another crypto mat and I'm gonna change this object ID to material name. And what this is gonna do is create an object buffer for each material in the scene. I'm gonna rename these real quick and then I'll render them. Uh, uh, so, I went ahead and cheated a little, but if I clicked render, this would spit out uh, two crypto mats and a final, but I already rendered them. So I can show you what those final renders look like. So we have our uh, we have our beauty pass and it actually is worth noting um, the crypto mats themselves had the VEXRs. That's just the, the way they work. So it'll spit them out as an EXR. Um, so yeah, we have our crypto pass, our beauty pass. This is just the you know, the, the normal render. And then these are the crypto mats. So I'm drop the object one in here first in After Effects. And of course you see it's uh, black, it doesn't have anything going on uh, because we need the uh, we need the crypto mat effect. So it's under 3D channels and we're gonna put crypto mat on this layer. Uh, come over here uh, to our effects tab. So this is where this is where it starts to get incredibly powerful. So the way a crypto mat works is if you start clicking on things, it's gonna generate object buffers for them. So as you can see, every object in this scene is assigned a different color. And as I click on it, I could select that to be an object buffer. So the previous workflow would have been in C4D to make a tag, label that tag like object buffer one, 
add that to the output module, you know, spit it out. It's a different layer, a different file. Now they're all contained in one. And the best part about this is I can combine them with like simple commands you already know. So if I hold shift and click another island, now these are, you know, they're grouped together or I can grab this border and add it. Uh, alternately, I can hold control and cut something from the crypto mat. It's just such a quick way of generating an object buffer for an object. It speeds up work dev immensely. I will say the crypto mats get a little heavy when you're rendering, you know, when you're working with them in motion, but they're, they're certainly within tolerance. Um, and then over here in the output, you set this to mat only. Um, I'm not sure why that didn't, why that. There we go. This is just being slow. Uh, and what we get is a Luma mat. So if we were to come over here and set this to, you know, the Luma channel on this, it's just going to pull off those crypto mats. And of course, we can come over here and we can update this. We can remove stuff from this. We can, in After Effects, modify our object buffers. It's so powerful for look development. It's such an efficiency thing. Um, and then, of course, the other crypto mat. Let me pull this in here. Let's back to normal. Uh, put the crypto mat effect on here. This one is the one that we set up with the material ID. So now it grouped everything that shares a material. So all these glass islands shared the same material. So this might be a faster way of grouping objects, um, of, of kicking out mats. And it took me two seconds to set up these render settings in, in C4D. And you get this incredibly robust uh, matting system. So anyway, I thought crypto mats were just the, the, the coolest thing, the coolest thing ever, and one of the most uh, efficiency boons of all time. Um, so with that being said, this is a pretty good segue to the next piece of efficiency thing I wanted to talk about, and that's just texturing and materials in general. So this comes up with our artists all the time, and in speaking you know, with artists and teams, um, no one builds their own textures anymore. It's, it's not worth it. Uh, texture libraries are, are the future. Uh, every C4D artist I know uses a different texture library. So I'm gonna show you a few of them. I'm not, I'm not paid by any of these guys. They're just really good libraries and really good assets. Um, so a couple, uh, a couple libraries that, you know, our team loves is uh, Polygon. They just have, you know, a gazillion assets, uh, a, a gazillion different uh, materials, uh, all different categories. They have a, um, a plugin for Redshift, so it'll build shader trees for you. Um, they're all super high quality. Uh, this is a really good one. There's uh, Quixel, which also has a uh, an integration. You know, these are image scans. This also has an integration into C4D. Um, another great material library. There's you know textures.com. There's Substance Source. There's a million of them. The Substance one is the you know the Adobe one that works with Substance Painter and all that. Um, texture libraries are absolutely the future. They're they're incredible, they're efficient, they're they're really high quality. And sort of the bar for what like is an acceptable texture in C4D is the expectation that the quality has risen so much that in ex the expectation is that like every material has like a color channel, you know, a diffuse channel, a reflectance channel, a bump channel, a normals channel. You can't just get away with like turning on reflections and, and setting it to a little blurry and it being done. The idea is that there's textures ported into these. We're driving, you know, photo reels easier. Um, so definitely use material libraries. But with that being said, I don't think you can get away with just downloading stock libraries and calling it a day. You have to modify these things. So our typical workflow, and actually this is, I mean, I think kind of everyone's workflow, but is that when we want to say like make a dirt or glass texture, we'll, we'll go through these libraries, we'll find one that really fits uh, what we're working on or looks good or is close. We'll put it in our scene and then we'll get in there and modify it. And there's a couple tricks I want to show you for modifying textures that I really like that add to some efficiency. Um, but really, you should be using texture libraries. If one of my artists comes to me and says, hey, I have this dirt material, it's going to take me a couple hours to build it out, I'll be like, that's a waste of time. Down download it off a library. The libraries are cost effective. Uh, they're good. Uh, there's a million of them out there. No one no one builds their own textures anymore. It's just, it's just not worth it. That's a little unfair if there's like a really specialized case where you wanted, you know, you have a very stylized or unique look. Sure, that build a texture for that. But a lot of what you do in C4D is simulating life. And as long as you're simulating real world materials, there's a good chance those have already been built out in a high quality way on one of these libraries. But I do think it's good to, uh, to know how to modify textures. So uh, 
this is a glass scene I have. Let me turn on the render view so you can see what I'm, uh, what I got here. Um, it's a glass sphere. Uh, this glass texture has some, you know, smudges, some blurry reflections on it, uh, a couple of, you know, some, some little color shading. Um, but something that I find becomes really uh, useful when modifying textures, and this one's already uh, hooked up this way, but I'll show you how I did it, um, is by putting ramps into the values. And actually, I'm going to do this uh, with the Redshift render view open, so as I make these changes, you can see them happening. Um, so we have right here, uh, going into our base color, uh, there's this smudge texture, and this is the, the smudges you see you know, on, on the glass. Uh, well, actually, the smudge texture is used in a, a few places. Um, but it's it's driven through a ramp. And I actually really like these because um, ramps are a really easy way of controlling values in a texture. So if the texture comes in and it has a, uh, you know, a, an image ported into to one of the channels, I'll come over here and I'll get a ramp. Let's drag this in here. And I'll take the out color of this and I'll, Got it, first try. Um, I'll take the out color here, and we'll plug it into the base color. And then, by connecting it through this ramp, I can control the levels of these smudges. So if I dial this down, you see as I push it more into black, the smudge is decreased. So our, uh, our circle over here got cleaner. And if I take this way up to white, the smudges increase. And now we're seeing almost all smudges. And I love taking every uh, texture that's being ported in here, especially when it's like something that's going through a black, when it's going through a black-white channel, and putting it into a ramp. Uh, it just gives you a lot of control over that, uh, over how powerful that effect is, uh, very easily. So if it's not set up that way already, I'll come in here, add these ramps, and then I can kind of move these back and forth and really start to dial in the look I want from a stock asset uh, very quickly. And I think that's the really key thing about the whole industry is moving towards using stock assets. It really doesn't pay to model things that are already built. It doesn't pay to build textures that are already built, but you still have to know how to, to modify them. If you're just using stock stuff and throwing it in a scene as stock stuff, you're going to start to get really repetitive looks. Your stuff is going to start to look like stock graphics. So yes, use the efficiency of these model kits, but absolutely go in and customize them. And actually, that's another one I want to talk about. Same thing with 3D models. In most cases, it's probably not time efficient to build your own 3D models. It's probably more time efficient to, you know, come over to Turbo Squid and find a good model that's close and use that. I find modeling gets a little more dangerous if you're just using um, if you're just using uh, these as the base. You have to do a lot more modification in the model to make it your own and unique than you do the materials. Uh, and there's a couple other traps with models. One, you got to check the license on models. Like those libraries, those are royalty-free libraries. A lot of models have licenses, so you got to watch out for that. But also, you need to modify the models, uh, much like you do the textures. And let me, and also, models are more expensive, and the model libraries are more expensive, so it's a little harder to rely on just libraries for models. But I still think more times than not, it's more efficient to to use the model library. So, uh, I have an example of uh, modifying some models that I want to talk about. And this one I think is a, a really good one. So I have this, it's a space door I downloaded. And this is the classic example of why you should modify your models. It's like for the last, since Star Wars, so whatever, 50 years, all space doors, oh, let me come over and use the LS trick. Uh, all space doors open the same way, right? They they slide, they slide open. And, and this is just how they animate. And we've sort of, define this as it's like become a trope like they, they all slide open in the same fashion and if you don't come in and modify your, your model you're gonna have sliding doors like everyone else there's different ways for doors to open there's different animations that could work you could change this and modify it and, and make it your own um, and I actually I'll, I'll make one real quick but I actually saw the the literal application of this it's in the the Dune movie, in the new movie that came out, they have these like louver shaped blast doors. And I remember seeing them in the film and being like, man, that door was really cool. The like architecture of the door didn't really change. They just changed how they animated it from the stereotypical slide. And it did, it worked. It gave it a little bit of personality. It made it feel a little more unique. Um, I'm not gonna do the Dune doors, doors justice, but essentially what they did, and it's a small change, but there's just open like louvers. They're just, just rotated instead of uh, to make a slit, instead of having the door panel slide to open. 
And those are the kind of modifications you have to make to models. Like you can get a lot of use out of this, but don't just leave it as the sliding door. Otherwise, we're all gonna be using the same Star Wars blast doors for the next 50 years still to come. So I think you have to customize your models, you have to customize your textures, but really starting from a place of stock models and textures, um, really is uh, really is the future and uh, you know almost almost all the artists I work with and use 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 material libraries it's just it's the world we live in um so those are most of the like key efficiency tricks that I wanted to talk about so there's sort of one final subject I would like to get into and that is uh, AR and VR and how it's the future um so let's talk. So AR and VR are going to be a huge part of the future of our industry. Um, it's a good time to be a, uh, an artist because of this. Um, and we can see this coming. We, we know that the progression of media is towards interactivity. Uh, it, it started with, you know, there's the, go back, there's radio, and then radio was eclipsed by television, and then television was eclipsed by interactive media. This has already happened. Um, the, the video game industry is larger by revenue than the movie industry. The largest piece of media today is social media. You, uh, you know, Instagram, Facebook, which is a form of interactive media. Um, and they've, they've edged out uh, linear television, w which is crazy because linear television was massive. Like its market share over media consum consumption was huge. And, and uh, interactive media uh, edged that out. And AR and VR are just the next evolution of that interactive media they're just the uh, they're more interactive and i think uh kids born today are gonna like look at the linear television that, that we had and they're gonna be like wait you can't you can't talk to the host you can't chat with this guy and, and, and interact with them you, you can't move the camera around it, it's gonna seem it's gonna seem archaic to them um so there's definitely this drive uh, forward for for a ar and vr and it, it definitely is the future. Like the investment in it is there. You know, Wall Street investment funds are putting money into it. Uh, like Facebook's uh, metaverse announcement, the technology is being pushed. Um, but I think uh, uh, one of the reasons when you say something like, oh man, virtual reality is going to be the future, why people kind of reject that is like they've done the like Oculus Rift, Rift demo where they put on the little headset and they're looking around and they're like, oh wow, I'm in the Sistine Chapel. Cool. And like, the novelty of that wore off on me like five after the first five minutes. Like if I have to watch one more headset demo where I'm in the Sistine Chapel, it's like skateboard videos. Like skateboard videos were so cool to me when I was growing up. You know, the first time I saw someone ollie down a staircase, I was like, wow, that is awesome. But now I have seen so many skateboard videos that uh, you would have to be like on fire jumping out of a helicopter for me to care and even then I don't think I would look up from my phone. So like uh, the same is true the same is true for uh, for the VR the VR uh, experience. You can't just drop someone in a room and be like, "Oh, this is cool. Look around." That was sort of like the idea when when virtual reality first came out. They're like, "Oh, I know. We can put them in the 50-yard line at the Super Bowl. They can have the best seats in the house. It'll be such an incredible experience." And what ended up happening is that in experience wasn't incredible. It wasn't actually better than the experience you got watching the Super Bowl at home on your TV. And the reason it wasn't as good is because that experience on the television is put together by a director, a producer, and an entire team with combined 10,000 years of experience. And that presentation is like the perfect balance of action shot, reaction shot, coach shot, replay, graphic, uh, player's wife, slow motion shot, replay, action shot, back to the field, aerial shot, bio about the player. And they do this cutting and editing with such a cadence that this presentation is is flawless and it's curated. And I think that's the keyword. It's a curated experience. Um, so I think when people think of like what AR and VR is, like right now, the AR and VR space is you discovering for yourself, which is cool, but it's actually not as rewarding as observing a, a curated experience. Um, However, that doesn't mean that AR and VR can't be curated. And I think a very good example of where we see this play out is uh, like live production, like Broadway shows have really mastered this um, this experience. So like at a Broadway show, there's the, uh, the main actors. Uh, they're on stage and they're dancing and your eye knows where to look. Your eye knows who, who the leads are. 
you know, the spotlight helps inform that, but you know where to be looking and you know what the point of interest is and you know how to follow the story. You can look around at the back, the uh, backup dancers and that's fun. Sometimes it's fun to explore the set and sometimes it's fun to look at the, the backup dancers and look around, but you always know where your eye can return to, to get the experience. You always know how to be led back home, how to, uh, yeah, how to rejoin the show. So there is an element of exploration, but for the most part, the show's curated and it's done with such like a delicacy and balance that like the spotlights fade and, and rearrange that like set pieces change without you even noticing or people come in and out of set where you could look at them and see them, but, but you don't because they, they, they lead you through this experience. No one's turning around and looking at the exit sign. You know what the point of interest is um, and you know, <laughs> you know where you should be focusing on. And I think that's important because as 3D artists and, and people are going to be at the forefront of building this technology, to some extent, we're going to be the stewards of this technology. And it, it, you know, it can be on us to inform uh, clients and producers and directors about the potential and the possibilities of AR and VR. So I don't think we should just make these you know, Sistine chapels where people can look around in. It really does need to be um, a curated experience uh, to, to be rewarding. And one place we see that like, the immediate play out of like AR and VR is set design. Um, virtual set extension is very popular, but full on virtual sets are really blowing up. They're more cost effective than building a real set. And I think they have a lot more, um, a lot more potential than, uh, than traditional sets do. Uh, I think you, we, we can really push um, virtual sets so far. So I wanna show you something here that I thought was kinda cool, maybe kinda interesting, stand by. Uh, so this is the, uh, this is the original Jeopardy game board. Uh, Jeopardy has a special place in my heart. We've done a bunch of work for them. So definitely a fan of the show. Um, but this is like how they started with the questions of Jeopardy. It's like a very analog paper thing. And, and I want to show this to show that like these set uh, innovations have been happening since the history of television. And virtual sets are just the next step in that. And they're going to just replace standard sets. They're, they're, it's happening. And I think I can show it on uh, show how I mean. So this is a uh, Jeopardy's first set. You know, they had a, uh, they used the little, uh, the little punch cards. Um, but then they modernized and they got the televisions in there. So they the very round, you know, like tube televisions with some pretty thick borders around them. Uh, advanced another generation. They started, they reduced the border a little, you know, getting a little more HD. Um, and now we have the modern Jeopardy set. And this set is like, you know, it's an LED wall. There's still uh, some borders there, but it's a seamless canvas and it looks a little modern. And I think the next iteration of this, the next step of this, this can be a virtual game board. That doesn't need to be on the set. That'll be way cheaper to fabricate. It could move and animate and react as the, the categories are called out. Um, and no one actually physically interacts with this thing anyway, so it could be all virtual. And you don't have to, technology to the point, you don't have to compromise on quality. It will look just as good. You know, we'll have all the reflections on the floor and everything, it will like look realistic. Um, so I think that's progression and as people <laughs> really, the budget is what leads people to this. When they look at the cost of fabricating a real set, building a virtual set is cheaper. And I think the virtual set can be more powerful. So much like how I was talking with like the, the VR experience of how there's sort of this, uh, responsibility to maybe not just throw people in the Sistine Chapel and have them look around. I'm sure, look. I'm sure the Sistine Chapel is beautiful. I've never actually been there outside of a headset. I'm not trying to <laughs> crap on it. But um, I think uh, I think much like how we can do a better job of how we present uh, VR content, I think we can also do a much better job of like virtual sets and AR content and augmented reality and set extension. Um, and what I mean by that is like right now, the current sort of philosophy behind virtual set design is make it look like a real set. Like make the wood material look like actual wood and the floor looks like actual glass or whatever. And we've hit that bar. And that was probably a good place to start, but there's still sort of this historical precedent of like, don't do anything that you couldn't do in real life, which bothers me. <laughs> so let me show you some examples of how we can start maybe pushing set design um, in a new and exciting way. So this is a, a, a rendering we did for a, a potential set and never, Never saw the light of day, um, but I thought we made some, some cool choices here uh, that I wanna talk about. Um, so one of the main things is that the set itself animates and reacts to what's happening in the set. So it, it's topical. So as something happens like a goal, the set itself moves and changes to emphasize that moment. We already see some of this in like current physical sets. You know, there's like a, a monitor behind the talent that updates with the player's headshot or whatever, or, or like at news, you know, there's the over the shoulder graphic uh, that, that changes as, as the stories go by. 
But we can take that a step further. The whole set can react and change to draw attention to what's happening or to make it feel more reactionary or dynamic. And I'm not saying it has to be these huge global sweeping moves. Like these camera moves are strung together one after another and this would be a lot, but it could be done with some elegance and sophistication where there's like subtle tweaks or subtle things change or things rearrange to, to celebrate different moments or call attention to the different stories that I think could make for a much more dynamic broadcast. And this is something you can't do in a physical set. You couldn't have like these 30 ton rings of concrete going up and down on a whim, but with a virtual set, this is possible. And I think we should start exploring what's possible with a virtual set instead of trying to make it fall into line with what was done before in physical sets. Another example of the possibilities of virtual sets is uh, scale. And of course everyone knows this, but they can be huge and you can have these really huge dynamic camera moves. Now, this would be done with a virtual camera, so the talent couldn't actually be in there for this, but you could still show off the set and the environment in a really cool way. Um, this was an animation ex experiment uh, for a Twitch set, and it's a, a whole stadium, right? So you fly through it and then the you know shows the winners. Um, but I love the idea that you can do these massive camera moves and have these massive spaces. You're not constricted by like the size of the studio that you're filming on, or even in this case, the size of the tiny green screen room that the talent's in. You can have these huge sets, Furthermore, the talent doesn't have to just be in the center of the set. The talent can move to different parts of the set by just moving the set. Like the, the talent stays still, you know, but you can move, you render one end zone and render the other end zone. So you can start to explore different areas and really start to have like a ton of different looks, a, a ton of different motions, huge camera moves, motion and reactionary sets. I, I think the potential for, for what set design is, we're just scratching the surface. And I think one thing that's really cool about this Aside from just the, the like physical layout of the set, the design and stylization of the set is not prohibited by cost. Like we don't have to mine the marble to build a marble pillar. We just texture it in marble. And it's something that like us in the graphic space have been doing for years. Actually, let me pull this up. It's a website. It's not a, a shameless ton, a plug, but man, look at how good these graphics look. Um, <laughs> here's that. We've been putting logos in sets for years and okay, Sure, maybe the, the like environments that we put a logo in aren't sophisticated enough to be a set, so maybe we need to be learn a little from traditional sets, but we can really start to explore these spaces and bring like this sense of, of grandeur and make maybe some like exploration and, and experimentation uh, to these sets in a way that wasn't possible in physical sets. So I think we can push the way sets act, move, and react. We can push the scale, and also we can push the style and design, and we've been exploring these really cool like futuristic, crazy environments as c4d artists for years like let's let's get some people in these <laughs> let's get these in green screen um i really love that i think it's an exciting uh, application of uh, of c4d and again i think uh as as a c4d artist like their quest for this are going to keep going up people are going to be involved in it and i think we should think about what we're doing because we're really going to make like decisions that that influence the like what virtual sets look like for you know decades to come and it's sort of like the uh the blast door, like let's just not make the Star Wars blast door over and over again, because that's how doors always open on spaceships. Let's look at different ways to open open the door, yeah. metaphorically. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a lot of potential there. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my, uh, I guess my my spiel on uh, <laughs> VR and AR. It, it really is the future. It's a higher level of interactivity. Media has shifted towards interactivity, uh, and it's a cool time to be a C4D artist, because that this is the software that's that's going to, to, to build these worlds. Um, so yeah, I think that covers most everything I wanted to talk about here today. Um, I'll throw up the uh, I'll throw up the old splash page, but uh, it, it was great great to be here. A great a great talking. Definitely a huge shout out to Maxon for having me. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, find us on the internet. It's been fun. I'll see you guys in that virtual set someday. Thanks, guys. Take care.